I'm, I'm grateful to be invited to speak to you on uh, one of my favorite subjects on the scriptures and uh, kind of how that is part of our lives for me. It is uh, my goal that to get people into the Bible, to do whatever I can to open up the Bible, to make it accessible and to help in understanding so that um, it's something that you're comfortable going in. Have you ever felt uncomfortable reading the Bible? Yeah? Um, the Old Testament where everybody's killing everybody. Right. <laughs> right. It's like, oh my gosh. Really? Sometimes doesn't it feel like I'm in somebody else's house and I shouldn't touch anything. I just get out of this and I'll get back to something I know. Right? Well, that's not how God intended the Bible to be. So uh, what we want to do is focus on how do we make that accessible to us all, because that's really the purpose. So I wanted to ask if you would share, if anybody would share a memory, a good memory of the scriptures, something, you know, like you got your Bible in fifth grade, or, or just something about the Bible that is really precious to you. I Claire? always remember my grandpa now, who was a minister, telling me the story of Joseph and his technicolor coat, oh. and sit, sitting on it. Every time we go visit him, I'd have that story. Ah, great, great. So that Bible story by, by your grandfather? Mm -hmm. What a treasure. Yes. What a treasure. Mm -hmm. Nice. Other, other experiences with the Bible that are wonderful. A memory. Yeah? I got my grandma's Bible when she died. Ah. <coughs> yeah. It's the one that I think inspired me the most. Okay, yeah, you get to see what inspired Grandma too, right? By looking, having her Bible, absolutely, absolutely. Bryn? Um, in college, we started having small group Bible studies, and our group has continued on till today and continues on. And just the wisdom other people have, the sharing back and forth of that from it, um, the knowledge, and, and the people themselves, and. We really prayed for God to show us new things in those scriptures. Yeah, nice, nice, ongoing Bible study. Well, I, one of the things for me was when I was in high school, a new translation came out, or somewhere around there, a new translation came out. And um, it, it was called the New Testament in Modern English, the J.B. Phillips translation. And I, I grew up in a church, so I got my fifth grade RSV when I was a kid. And, and But I tell you, this Bible talked in a different language that resonated with me. And so it really, I think, helped me realize that the Bible was accessible to me. And uh, so I, just, I used to carry this everywhere and write in it. Uh, it was just just really a help in helping me fall in love with the scriptures. The other Bible I wanted to share um, was actually my dad's. So this uh, came to him from his grandmother, who was the love of his life. Chubby, he called her. Chubby. And uh, she gave it to him in 1943. And when he landed on the beaches of Iwo Jima, he had this in his blouse pocket like this. Eight days later, he was shot through the chest. Oh, bullet missed his heart by an inch. Went all the way through. It was a steel bullet. Went all the way through. Oh, my gosh. And they carried him down to the beach. And at the beach, the corpsman said, Okay, Marine, what do you want to keep? Well, he wanted to keep his fighting knife, his K-bar. <laughs> that wasn't going to work. <laughs> and he said, In my Bible. So this is his Bible. He gave it to me before he died. And it has his blood in it. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So it's really... There's a lot of memories in that. It's, it's precious for that reason. But uh, to, just to know my dad's journey, too, that rather than being his grandma's Bible, later in his 50s it became his Bible. He, he gave his life to Christ. So um, when he gave this to me, it just is like, I, I, it's just a, a wonderful treasure. Not because of what's in it so much as what's on it. Uh, and, and the memory of him. So. Uh, Bibles are important to us in a lot of different ways. Maybe you have one of those big, huge family Bibles. Uh -huh. and it's like, who wants those now? <laughs> right? It's kind of like getting rid of your china that you still want it. No way. Well, 
If someone asked you, what is the Bible, what would you say? What would you say the Bible is? Somebody who doesn't know, a neighbor, <clears throat> friend, what would you say the Bible is? There are no wrong answers here. The Word of God. The Word of God, okay. A guide to living a good life. A guide to living a good life. Great. History. History. Mm -hmm. I probably should write these on the board. Mm -hmm. But you don't see my handwriting. History, guide to life, the Word of God. What else? Okay. An assembling of, of wisdom from two different religions. An assembling of religion from two different religions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? Well, I, I tried to put together a definition. And definitions are fraught with what we leave out of them. But actually, what I said, it is the inspired revelation of God through the language of human writers to accurately and infallibly express God's truth with authority for our lives, faith, and hope. It is, first of all, the inspired revelation of God. For me, it's not just a book. It's not an ancient book. It's not just uh, a compilation book. It is the inspired revelation of God in both the Old and New Testaments. Um, it is uh, through the language of human writers. Humans had to take that inspiration and put it down, and to write it down. And so, um, I think every one of us, if we wrote down the same experience, we would write it a little bit differently because of who we are and how we see each other and what our nuances are. And so, the scripture is full of human beings writing down the inspired word that God has given them. And you can't take the humanity out of it, but neither can you take the divinity out of it. Um, it accurately and infallibly, so it's, it is what God wants us to know. It is the word that God has given us, and uh, that express God's truth. Uh, God's truth is there to be revealed. The, uh, the, the main character in the scriptures is God. It's all about God. And so, um, with, and it has authority for our lives, our faith, and our hope. Um, those are elements that are just important to me. So, I think how we view Scripture affects what we get out of it when we read it, when you study it. If it is just a bunch of historical writings, uh, you can be like uh, Thomas Jefferson and cut out the parts you don't like in the Bible. Right? He's got one of the holy Bibles because it's got all these holy. cut out places in it. Oprah Winfrey. Yeah, so it, it really does approach affect how we approach it. Um, so it's important for us to really understand what our preconceptions are when we come to the Scripture. So um, where, did, where did we get this Bible? Where did it come from? That's what I want to explore a little bit here in our time together. You realize it was not always written down. It started as an oral story. And we don't quite get oral tradition like, like it was. Um, this was before people all wrote and read. And so the important stories of the community were communicated orally. And you remembered. You remembered volumes. That was part of that. I mean, I can't remember what Janet told me yesterday. <laughs> right? But... But they could remember these stories. And there was a, a language for them. And there was a cadence for them. And it, it was a very oral uh, tradition. And, and we don't find that a lot. Uh, maybe in some, in some Native American or uh, Pacific Islander tribes. Uh, I spent a summer in the southeast of Alaska as a missionary. And uh, we were in a little Presbyterian church that had no pastor. So I got to preach for four times. <laughs> I told them everything I knew the first time, and they just like, okay, now what? And uh, we were having lunch after church with one of the elders of the church, William Nelson. He was 73 years old, just a kind of bear sort of guy. But we're lying around his living room because we ate too much salmon and drank too much soda, and he starts telling us the stories of the Clinton Indians. Oh, yeah. 
Now, I have a tape recorder of it. I'm not sure the tape's any good anymore, but I, I was able to record it. Uh, and, and his language changed, and his, his cadence changed, and, and it, was, it was, this was the story of, the, uh, of, my, of my community. And you know, always in an oral society, it's that society that governs it. So if Bob gets it a little bit wrong, boy, they're coming down and saying, Bob, you've got to get this right. It didn't happen this way, it happened this way. So there is, there is some structure and some authority that is there uh, for people at, as they tell the story. So this was 1973 when William, he actually adopted me and another uh, one of the mission team for the Clinkett tribe. So it was almost 50 years ago, and the question is, what happened to William's stories? What happens to those when, when the keeper of the story is no longer there? Uh, and in, in uh, the University of Alaska is out collecting, listening to stories, having them collected and written down. And so that's what happens in Scripture. There comes a time to write it down. And so it goes from this very oral world to a very um, to a written down world which is another skill altogether somebody who has a Bible I'm so glad you all brought your Bibles <laughs> somebody has a Bible will you look up Luke chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 Unto us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. So, what's Luke's, what is Luke doing? He's talking to eyewitnesses. He's, he's looking to what's accurate. He's getting confirmation. Theophilus is a wonderful name. It means lover of God. So, we don't know whether it's actually a Theophilus or if he's writing to the community of faith. You lovers of God. But his goal is that you lovers of God will know We'll have an accurate account. We'll know what those people who were there in the beginning actually said. And it, it really is a remarkable transition from just the oral to, to writing it down. Um, so, writing it down. Writing it down meant um, it was written in a language. It's written on a, it's not a piece of paper. It would have been on parchment or vellum, uh, animal skin. Uh, ultimately, and both of those decay over time, as do books, the codex, when it was written in a book. So it meant that even though I wrote this 300 years ago, you can't pick it up or it's dust. So it has to be copied again and again and again. And there was never any sense that we got it wrong. There was a huge sense for everybody who was copying that this is the Word of God. I am handling God's Word, and it's very important for me to get it right. Um, now, there are, there are nuances as you go through different translations, but there is always this concern to get it in, right, and there's incredible accuracy in the transmissions. Um, today, you, you have it on your phone. Mm -hmm. But then, imagine how hard it was to get a copy of the Scriptures. Well, I spent my whole life uh, copying the Gospels. That's all I got done in my life. Or I, I, I spent hours and hours copying. It's just remarkable to think what, what went into what we have today. I mean, today I have over 2,000 versions on my phone. Wow. <laughs> in, in multiple languages that I have no idea what they say. But I'm assuming they say the same thing as it does in English. So... Um, 
They were aware it was God's word. It wasn't something they handled lightly. And, and you know, in the case of the Apostle Paul's letters, he would write uh, uh, his epistles, his letters, and then it would go to Bob in Ephesus, and Bob would have, would have Nancy uh, transcribe it, and then they'd send that copy off over to uh, Corinth. Or, I mean, it's, it's how the word got out. Copy, copy, and always aware of how precious this is that they had. And like the oral tradition, it was the community, this time the community of faith, that determined whether you got it right or not. If you'd messed up that paragraph, or you, you changed words, it was the community, the church. And you know, it, uh, it wasn't until the 4th century that the church finally closed the canon, as we say, and decided all these books are are the inspired Word of God. And there's a lot of other things floating around, but these are the ones that belong there. It's the fourth century, so 400 years. Or probably 300 years after the writing. It's finally said this. And again, it was the community that put that together. So what we have is really this unique and very special book. And uh, a lot of work and devotion in preserving it for us. Think about that. I'm writing this for... For people I don't even know, we'll never see, but I'm giving them the Word of God. Um, so the Spirit is in, not only in the writing, but it's also in the version that we read. The Spirit is present in us, and I think that's why sometimes you read a story over and over again, and suddenly it hits you in the face like I've never read it before. You know, the Spirit of God, inspired in the beginning, is there in the midst of it. So, um, we don't have any original copies of the Bible. We don't have any original autographs. It's only copies. And so does that make a difference to you, that we don't have the original? Nobody has the original. All we have are the, the faithful copies. And we have the witness of centuries gone by. You know, there are people who 100, 200 years later would be quoting the scripture and it would be the same scripture that you and I have. So we have that outside witness to the scriptures as well. Imagine, though, that we didn't have the scriptures. What would we know? If you didn't have the Bible, what would you not know? We wouldn't have a value system then. A value system, right. What's right and what's wrong. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What else wouldn't you know? Way to salvation. The way to salvation? Well, God. we might have a value system, but it would be man-made. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not God's. So it's not God. You wouldn't know God's values. Right. Okay. What language was it written before? Say again? What language was it written before? Because I think Luke was Greek, right? Right. And so the original script was in what language? Well, we'll get to that. <laughs> we will get to that. <laughs> so, so we wouldn't know what the meaning of life is. We wouldn't know who God is, much less what God values. We wouldn't know how we ought to live. We wouldn't know how we relate to the world around us. We wouldn't know how to pray. We wouldn't know if it's okay to be angry with God. He's going to just throw us out. We've got to offer a bunch of sacrifices so we placate Him. There's so many things we wouldn't know. We would not know that God wants to have a relationship with us. Just a stone carving somewhere. We wouldn't know that God is a God of relationships. Somebody else who has a Bible, will you look at Jeremiah 9, 23 through 34? I have a couple of scriptures, so who will look at the Jeremiah passage? Who's, who's going to look that up? I'll do that. Thank you, great. Uh, someone else look at John 1, 1 through 4. Any volunteers for that? Okay. And then... John 3.16. Anybody get that one for me? All right, Marsha, great. 
Sorry, what were the verses? Nine. Jeremiah nine. chapter nine, verses twenty-three and twenty-four. Oh. Thus says the Lord: Do not let the wise boast in their wisdom. Do not let the mighty boast in their might. Do not let the wealthy boast in their wealth. But let those who boast boast in this: that they understand and know me, that I am the Lord. I act with steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. Yeah, knowing God is greater than knowing all the human Everything. wisdom and human accomplishments. But knowing God is greater. Boast in knowing God. All right. Um, so God, God's purpose was to be known... And the greatest, the scripture is a revelation of God and God, God's self, but the greatest revelation of God is what? Jesus. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Who has John 1, 1 through 4? I do. Okay. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life. And the life was the life of all people. Jesus is the Word made flesh. The greatest revelation. The absolute pinnacle of scriptural revelation, if you will, is Jesus. He's God written in the flesh for all of us. And... Um, and I just, I just love the fact that we know that. Um, we're taught that when we're little kids, aren't we? Remember that, what's the song, Jesus Loves Me? Mm. How's that go? This I know. This I know. This I know. Oh, for the Bible tells me so. So from the very beginning, we're saying our relationship with God is found in the Bible. And we want our children to know that. We sing that to them. And, and you all remembered it, right? Yeah. So, um, so I want to take a moment and look at look at the Bible. Then, as I told you, my my phone, my U version, has two thousand different uh, translations in it, um, more than I'll ever need. Uh, but which one do you turn to? They're all trying to communicate the truth of the text. And it's uh, keeping a belief that this is God's word and you don't mess with it. So the challenge is not to create a one-to-one -one translation, but to get the truth of the translation. Have you ever translated from one language to another? Mm -hmm. Tried to translate something into Spanish? Mm -hmm. Or Spanish into English? Mm -hmm. And it's like there's stuff there that I don't know what to do with. <laughs> yeah? And, and, and it doesn't quite carry the same way. Or yeah. maybe they have a word. You know, it's said that the Inuits up in Alaska, uh, the, the Eskimos, have 50 words for, for snow. <laughs> they have no word for lamb, by the way. So if you're translating the scripture and talking about the Lamb of God, they have no idea what you're talking about. Right? So I... I and, Looking around, I found that the Scots have 421 words for, for snow. <laughs> and they're going to fight you over each one of them. Hey. Yeah, I'm, I'm a squat, too. Yeah, we've got quite a few of those around here. Me, too. get after you. I know. Thank you. So, um, when you talk about the authority of Scripture, what gives it authority for you? What makes it authoritative? There's a whole school of thought that says, well, if it doesn't have any errors in it, then it is God's Word. But if there's an error in it, it can't be God's Word. So basically, trying to prove the authority. In, in our tradition, we start that this is the Word of God. We start with, this is the authority. You, you don't have to prove it. You don't have to justify it. It is. That's a given. This is God's word. 
So that, that authority is present in our lives from the very beginning. Um, and you know, there weren't many copies of the Bible available, or, or even the Hebrew Scriptures. Or they, they kept all the Scriptures, the Torah, in, in the synagogue mm -hmm. or in a temple. Mm -hmm. And not everybody had them. Um, not everybody uh, could study them. Not everybody could read or understand. So in medieval times, they actually had the Bible. It was so precious, they had the Bible chained to the lectern. So nobody would steal it. <laughs> You can't take it home and have a Bible study at home. Um, so what I, what I want to do, I, I, I listened to your first session, and March brought up, reminded everybody of the Kerygma Bible study. Uh, did anybody take the Kerygma study? Just March and I. Oh, a couple, couple people, great. Great, well, what I have, what I put on your table is uh, one of my favorite things from that Kerygma study, was this little guide about how we got the English Bible. And so this is going to answer some of the questions, Simon, about, about where, where it came from. Um, and so on the left-hand column, as you look at it, it says events and experiences of the people of God written. And you notice that that's the Hebrew Scripture. So we have this whole section of Hebrew Scripture and how that impacts what we have today. And on the far right, you have... Here's the experiences of the New Testament, and that's written in Greek. Uh, there is an Aramaic track somewhere in here. In fact, you can find the Lamsa Bible, which is the Bible which is translated from the Aramaic. Uh, but we're just going to do this, <laughs> this journey. So you've got the Hebrew Bible. You've got the Scriptures, the Torah. You've got the Word of God. And then in the 2nd and 3rd century, or the 3rd and 2nd century B.C., it gets translated from Hebrew into Greek. And we call that the Septuagint. And that's actually the, the Bible that Jesus knew. The Greek translation it would be the ones that he knew. Now, he, he knew Hebrew, but this was the Bible that would have been used. This is the, the Torah, the scriptures that would have been used. And so um, there, there are some di little different nuances. Sometimes it's said a little differently because, right, we're going from Hebrew to Greek. And then the next big movement is you have the establishment of the church. And you have Jerome who translates the, that Bible into Latin. Anybody take Latin in school? Yeah, yeah. What kind of language is Latin? Dead. Dead. <laughs> it's very formal. It's very structured. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So you take another language and force it into this Latin form. And so we have the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, translated into Latin. So if he's using the Septuagint, he's going Hebrew to Greek to Latin. So there's three languages involved in that transition. And that becomes the Bible for the church until the Reformation. That becomes the scripture. And you have there on, it tells you that there's the Linz Farm Gospels, which are in northern England. Uh, this group uh, translate. Put, they took the Latin Vulgate and they put uh, Anglo-Saxon underneath it. So it's kind of interlinear. So there's a line of Latin and a line of Anglo-Saxon and a line of Latin and a line of Anglo-Saxon. Not very widely published. Um, but the big news comes uh, with, with Wycliffe. Where did my Wycliffe? Did it fall down? Was it that which one? Oh, uh, yeah, that's prob probably the Wycliffe that Bible that fell down. Oh, mm -hmm. well, that's the Great Bible. This is the Great Bible. Okay. I'm go around and find where I put it. I, wasn't, I had them all up here and said, no, nah, oh, that's the One maybe on that table? Is that it? No. So Wycliffe uh, translated the scriptures uh, using primarily the, the, the Vulgate. 
um, using the, the uh, Latin Bible into English. And it, it's a very uh, Latin form of English because he uses all the, the kind of the structure of it that he keeps, but he translates the first complete tr English translation of the Bible. Uh, so that's 1384 to 1395. And um, he wants the church to reform, to get rid of non-biblical practices, uh, but he's not, a, not really a reformer. But it, it's interesting, that's going on in the church in the late 1300s. The next, and really most, I think the most important one, is that the, uh, the Gutenberg Bible in 1455. Who, who knows about the Gutenberg Bible? The printing press. Yeah. They started printing on yeah. Right. So why is that so important? Because well, everybody can have one. Everybody can have one, yeah. right? You don't have to wait on 15 monks to die to get your copy. <laughs> I mean, movable press, putting the scripture, and, and this impacts the whole reformation of the church. Because now scripture becomes very available to everyone. Um, so, okay, let's jump over to the other column, to the, um, to the right, to the New, Test New Testament. So you have scriptures written in, the, in Greek. And you have a, a bishop, Bishop Aramaeus, who translates, who puts together a Greek New Testament. And the, the goal is you got fragments, you got pieces. He's putting together a Greek New Testament that's widely accepted. And that's important because you take the Greek New Testament and then in the Reformation, they said, wait a minute. We not only have the scriptures, but we have all these interpretations of scripture. So how about if we go back to the original language and translate? So they go back to, here's the Greek now. You've got a Greek New Testament to go back to. Uh, Martin Luther uses the Vulgate, but he also uses uh, the Hebrew when he makes his translation of the Luther, of the Luther Bible. Um, one, uh, uh, I said Aramaeus was a, a bishop. He's not. He's a Dutch philosopher. Um, so... The, his New Testament, published in 1516, there's a Spanish translation coming. Imagine that. They're using Hebrew, Latin, Greek, and Aramaic to write it in Spanish. Talk about a challenge. Mm -hmm. But to get it accessible to the people who, who need to hear it, that was the important thing. Um, Tyndale. Anybody know about Tyndale? So this is a very small facsimile of the Tyndale Bible. So Tyndale's in the um, 1525. So this is um, the first Greek with no Latin to English. So he's, he's got the New Testament. And it's widely distributed because of the printing press. And uh, a guy named Miles Coverdale, who will later write another uh, translation, um, he is involved in it as well, getting the Old Testament together. Um, but the problem was, you have a world that's split between Protestant and Catholic. Protestants don't like Catholics, Catholics don't like the Protestants. So um, the Roman Catholic Church was really upset because they translated language that sounded like he was anti-clerical. So I, they defrocked him, they <laughs> burned his, his books, they gave him to local authorities who strangled him to death, oh, and then burned him at the stake, oh, and buried him, and 40 years later they dug him up, and they revoked his salvation. Oh, <laughs> they crushed his bones, and they scattered them in the river. Uh -huh. Not a real popular guy with the Catholics. <laughs> That's how how this is when when we're moving the scriptures into the New Test into into the language. Um, Coverdale was the bishop, and he wanted to reform the church. Uh, he was fortunate enough to have a um, a patron who was Cromwell. 
So Cromwell on the Protestant side protected him from the Catholic uh, monarchy, uh, particularly later when Mary comes in. Uh, we have something called the, the Matthew Bible. Where's, where's, hmm? it's, it's one of those. It's over there. It's right there. There's one in the middle. The Matthew Bible. And that's written by under the pseudonym of Thomas Matthew. But his real name was John Rogers. And he was burned at the stake because he completed Tyndale and Coverdale's work and made the scripture uh, really accessible. He used the pseudonym to get away from Henry VIII. But Mary, Queen of Scots, Bloody Mary, had him executed. Um, so then we come, so now there's people fleeing England to get out from the Catholic. And there's uh, a lot of Protestants coming into, uh, into Germany and Switzerland and Holland. Um, and they come into Geneva. And under the guidance of John Calvin, uh, Theodore Beza, major reformers, they develop what's called the Geneva Bible. And what's interesting about this Bible, again, they're going from the original languages, it starts to have apparatus, we'll call it. It starts to have notes in it. It has maps in it. It has uh, like a concordance of cross-reference. It has, has, you can see, in, if you look at this later, you can see there's things written in the column for you. And, and it's very accessible, and it becomes the number one selling Bible. Shakespeare quotes it. The Pilgrims bring it over on the Mayflower. John Bunyan quotes it, Pilgrim's Progress. It becomes the Bible. And it reflects some reformed Protestant views of the world. Which makes King Jimmy of England, Catholic, upset. And he wants an authorized version of the Bible. And so that's what prompts uh, the writing of the King James Version. Now the Geneva Bible was so popular, it was actually the first Bible printed in Scotland. And there was an edict in Scotland that every home that could afford it had to have a copy of this Bible in that home. Can you imagine that? This, you got to have this. And it's the law. So... Um, Yeah, please. The Catholic service was always in Latin, correct, mm -hmm. until really the 60s. Right, right. So were the Bibles all written in Latin for the Catholic Church? Right, mm -hmm. right. So if you were a lay person, you had to at least understand Latin. Right. And that, that's, therein is the problem. Yeah. That there, there is no public school where you're learning Latin, mm -hmm. unless you're going to be a priest. So there's a small group of people who learn it, and even some of the priests don't learn it. So uh, in, in olden days, there there was a public school where you could study Latin. I went there. <laughs> in the olden days. Oh, you I knew, knew, you knew Martin Luther. <laughs> yeah, Martin Luther was a monk, remember? Yeah. So he was trained. Sure. So when he was upset, he wasn't trying to start a denomination. Right. He was trying to reform the Catholic Church. Yeah. And they said, well, heck with you, we're throwing you out. So he became begin, uh, part of the protesters, which we call Protestants. Did the original King James Version include the Apocrypha? I think it did. Okay. I think it did. Actually, there's the cover plate for the original King James oh, 1611. The one in the middle. It might have it. And this is also scripture. Now, good luck trying to read those, <laughs> unless you read Old English or maybe Latin. But here, here's the move to try and get scripture in the vernacular. And what that does is it gives power to people. Yeah. Right? Right. It's no longer just the church that controls the Bible. Right. The interpretations, the understanding uh, comes from the people. Uh, so then, then you just have a series of, of more translations. But notice in this graph that now they're all in the middle of the page. Right? So they've got the influence of the Hebrew and, and, and even the Latin, and they've got the influence of the New Testament. So these are, are taking all the ancient texts that they have 
and starting to translate those. The uh, English Revised Version, the American Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, the New English uh, Version, uh, the New, new um, International Version, um, the Jerusalem Bible, today's English language. That, that all comes down. And, and uh, you see there in the Greek, in 1968, they come with a, a Greek version, uh, which is called uh, the UBS text, or the United Bible Society's Greek text. And that's, that's the one that I learned in seminary. Mm. And that's the, uh, the one that you would have to learn and have to translate and have to learn to read. Uh, so it's a, it becomes a standard. And I'm not sure that's still true. I think it's still true. For Presbyterians only. <laughs> it's true now. Good for them. Are. Good for them, you said. So, um, how does that affect how you look at the Bible? That kind of journey of these <coughs> scriptures. And knowing that they had political implications, knowing that they had spiritual drives, knowing that they came from a translation of a translation of a translation, or from a region. I mean, you start thinking about that and thinking, what should I read? Um, and the great thing about the Word of God is it's true. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, it, it, it's like, okay, it came from the Latin, but it's still powerful. It changed Martin Luther's heart to realize he read the scripture and said, oh, we're saved by grace, not through faith. We're saved by yeah, faith, faith through grace <laughs> not and through not works. by works. <laughs> So you can't go selling indulgences to get into heaven. And, and so he says, wait, guys, you're doing it wrong. Remember, here's what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And at that day, the authority of the church was over the authority of Scripture. And, and in our tradition, it's the authority of Scripture that is the basis for what we do and who we are. Um, so for me personally... When I do my devotions, I think I told some of you this, I read four translations. I, I read from the Old Testament, usually a, a history. I can read Genesis through Chronicles. I, I will read minor prophets or major prophets. And I'll read a psalm. So I've got, I've got two Old Testament. And I'll read gospel and an epistle or other writings in the New Testament. So I've got four things going on in my phone. And I have three or four different translations that I'm reading from. I'll read the message. My favorite is the New International Version. But the New Living Translation, or I'll, I'll try a different one, the New Century Version. Um, because what happens is some new eyes are on the scripture and things speak to me in a way that maybe I didn't hear before. because. This is how I learned it in Sunday school. And when I was 12, my understanding was much smaller than it is now. So I would say, you need to find a scripture translation that speaks to you, that you understand, that you can pick up and read, and you don't need a theosaurus right next to you to figure out what, it's, what it is say. You need a Bible, and try them out. I mean. This application on your phone is free. So you can have 2,000 scripture <laughs> translations free. But, but look at it. Just because this is my grandma's Bible or my dad's Bible, I want the Bible that speaks to me. And that's my heart for all of you that it speaks to you. I think it has an incredible history that's important for us. But you need to know that it's all to, so that it communicates clearly to the people. That's what they're always trying to do. And so I think that's what we are about here as well. Um, get a Bible. You don't have to get one with all the apparatus, with all the notes and the cross-references. You just need one to read. Just one that, that you can understand and you can walk away. But I often walk away later in the day and go, wow. Ah, I was just reading about that in my devotions. So uh, that's my encouragement. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, if you got any questions, I'm happy to answer the questions. Um, you can look at some of these facsimiles up on the wall. Marilyn? Yeah, it's not a question. It's something that uh, has happened in the last few years, 20, 25 years ago. 
a Bible, St. John's uh, College commissioned a Bible to be written in calligraphy by, and I got the Queen's calligrapher, Donald Jackson, who formed a team. And it took them 10 years. Wow. They used real vellum, sheepskin, quills, all the original materials, and it's a visual feast that right. has illustrations. Right. If a word was left out, and, and you're concentrating very hard, and it's not that you don't have it right in front of you, yeah. mm -hmm. there's a little string that might come down to the bottom. A little bird might hold a little string. Uh. And Chapman College has some pages from it. Oh, really? And they're, you have to make an appointment to see them, but it's Incredible. Uh, well, uh, the artwork in scripture, it wasn't just copying the words, the illuminations and the pages. Oh, it's rich with gold and it's magnificent. Yeah. Donald Jackson uh, had <laughs> his eyesight, lost some of his eyesight in the 10 years wow. that this was happening. But, he had botanical artists and calligraphers and it's quite something. Yeah, that is quite something. Quite something. All right. Let's take a break. All right. Jesus loves you. There you go. Uh, that's the one. Okay. Um, so how many of you know the name David McCullough? Yes. The author? Yes. He did the Wright Brothers. He did, he did some on John Adams and Lincoln. So he, huh? Truman. 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 Okay. He, he has a little sign on his desk. And it says, the sign says, look at your fish. And so he explains it this way, that there was a a professor, a Harvard scientist in the 19th century named Louis Agassiz, A-G-A-S-S-I-Z. And uh, every student who came into his class, he gave this test. He'd go to a jar and he'd take out a fish. And he'd put it in a metal tray and he'd put it in front of him and said, look at the fish. And then he'd go away. <laughs> and when he finally came back, He'd say, what did you see? Well, not much. But he said, well, look at the fish. This would go on for days. <laughs> Until people, the students started, you couldn't use any tools. You could use your hands to turn it over, but you couldn't take it apart. This was a live fish? Yeah, it was. Uh, no, it was a dead fish. It was a dead fish. <laughs> it, was a dead fish. <laughs> it went on for days. It was a real dead fish. <laughs> It had odors, probably, yeah. most likely, after, most after, likely, after but uh, finally, uh, one student, let's see, he says, uh, one student who later became a famous scientist left us with the best account of the ordeal of the fish. After several days, he still could not see whatever it was that Agassiz wanted him to see, but he said, I see how little I saw before. And then the student had a brainstorm. He announced to Agassiz the next morning, paired organs on either side. Of course, of course, said Agassiz, very pleased. So I tell that story because I think our fish is the scriptures, particularly those of us who have known them so well. And we need to be able, if we're going to get out, something out of the scriptures, we need to take that time to look at them. Not just thumb through and say, okay, this one today. But to take the passage and to look at it, and to look at it, and to look at it, and to look at it. Just imagine three days of just looking at that same old fish. So, um, I, I, I want to, this is uh, actually I want you to turn to John 3.16. And this is a uh, study guide I got from my Old Testament professor who taught Psalms, who was David Allen Hubbard. And he taught us this. And I use it now with every scripture before I preach and before I teach. This is how I open the scripture up. So you take your paper.
So at the top of the page, I say this is what I'm going to look at. So we're going to look at John 3.16. And on the side, a quarter of the way or a third of the way down, run a line. Just run a line down your paper. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at John 3.16 and we're going to look at our fish. We're going to observe. So I always write it out longhand. I know I'm old school. And on a yellow pad, no less. <laughs> Don't do this on the computer. Yep. Yes, ma'am. I do this on, on a pad of paper, and I cannot get around writing it out longhand. I just can't. And uh, truthfully, it helps to read it aloud, too. Because if you remember, it was oral first. So sometimes there's things we hear, you know. Uh, Hebrew have, and Greek both have, they have poetry, they have words that sound alike. Um, I told you on Sunday about the difference between cut and prune. Mm -hmm. That our uh, ire for cut, and then prune for kathire. If you were reading that in Greek, everybody go, ah, oh, I get it, the word play there. Um, we don't have, we don't get that in English. But you still can get some of the, the experience of it. And you, you bring all your senses to it. Uh, you bring your imagination to it. You bring everything to that scripture text. So um, what I want you to do on your piece of... So this is where I would start. I'll, I'll start. So my text says the first word is for... And I would actually stop right there. Any word, any place in your text that stands out for you or add, raises a question... I'd stop right there, and over here in my column, I would say, I would ask the question, what does for mean? I want to define that. I want to say, so, so what does that mean, for? Because. 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 Well, if it means because, because of what? So that, that leads me to other questions. But you see, I'm, I may know the answer, but I'm writing the question over here. And then... Then I'll go on another line and I'll say, for God, this is my Greek letter theta, which I use as shorthand for God. Oh. <laughs> because the Greek word for God is theos, T-H-E-O-S. Mm -hmm. So, for God, and what did God do? Love so loved the world. So my translation says, so loved. And then I'd actually go for another line, the world. So I'm going to say, okay, for so something happened, something because of something's, this is connecting to something else, it's telling me. Um, for God, and I know who that is, but this is the, the full trinity, the, the wholeness of God, and I might say something about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or write the trinity on the side, so loved. So that so loved, it didn't, he just didn't love. In my translation it says so loved. Mm -hmm. What does that mean, so loved? A lot. Oh, a lot loved. Mm -hmm. Right. So loved. It's like this is a big love. Yes. This is a big love. So I'm going to write these things over here in, in my column. Uh, just, just my observations. Just my questions. Mm -hmm. Just um, So maybe there's the world. Well, is it just Israel? Mm -hmm. Is it just this world? Mm -hmm. And so that would want, I'd want to define the world. I'd want to look at that deeper and ask questions about what does that world mean? And as I go through a passage, and when I want to get to the end of the passage, I'll just draw a line here. And if I have any observations that I make, I'm going to put them, I'm, I'll, I might put them here, but I'm going to note that it's JB. This is my thought. <laughs> this is me going off on a tangent here. I may want to come back to it, or I may want to say, this is really important, and I'll star it. But just those things that stand out. Mm -hmm. And they might stand out differently to me at a different time. Uh, but this is just a way to get into the text. Um, so what I'd like you to do on your paper is finish the passage. Or, or do the whole passage. Make your own observations. Just John 3.16. For God so loved the world. And whatever your text that you have says... And I'd encourage you to use whatever text you have. And just take a minute 
and just observe. Just look at your fish. It's a very familiar fish, isn't it? So there's something there. Take a couple minutes and look at the fish. There are pens and there's extra paper if you need paper.
Okay, let's see what we got. Now, if I were Dr. Gazes, I would probably keep looking, <laughs> which I might do anyway. Uh, so, what, what kind of things did, how about, just tell me something you observed when you started. Bob? That these words are very definitive and very inclusive. So, mm. the words are so, so loved, the world, only son, everyone, and eternal. It's a very, very big. Very big. Yeah. Great, great. Other observations? Mark. Well, the word for sends me back to verse 15. That Jesus must be lifted up as was in the story of the Old Testament when Moses lifted up the serpent. Right. Right. So. That's, that's one of the great things when you've got a passage like this. One of the things you're going to want to do, after you make your observations, you want to go look at what's around it. What's the context of this? And with the word like for, because, you're like, because of what? Mm -hmm. It means you have to go back and say, because of this. You have to say, who's saying this, first of all? You know, you can go back and look at the story of Nicodemus. This is Jesus and Nicodemus, a religious leader. Um, so all that is kind of your context. But when you make an observation like this one word, it says, go back, look. Pay attention to what happened before. Because it's not just, we tear scripture bleeding out of the context. And, and it means a lot for God so loved the world. But when I put it back in context, there, there's another dimension to it that's rich. Okay, other other observations. Hey. That that he gave, uh, we didn't earn. We didn't earn it. Okay, gave. gave. We didn't earn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That, that's great. I didn't see that. I saw giving is not loaning. <laughs> it's like this is a permanent gift. Mm -hmm. This is. Giving, uh, which is which is powerful, but we didn't earn it. In fact, that, that uh, personally, that's one of the observations I found in here. There's no earned love. It, it, it's this unconditional love. It's, I mean, it's that so loved. There's no who did, who did God love? The world. The world. The world. I know some crummy people in the world. God loves the world. It's not only people he loves. It's not only people, it's creation God loves. The creation cries out for the salvation that comes in our lives. So God loved the world. So God loved people, God loved creation. God loved the order that is created. I mean, you just see how you just keep going, asking, so what does creation mean? What does the world mean? And then other observations. Perish. Hmm? Perish. Perish. What, what does perish what does mean? Perish mean? Does that mean that we're just going to be 300, we're going to be Methuselah? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> or, or, is that, or does that have etern you know, eternal implications? Does so that mean we, we stop existing? Uh, what does that mean? A great, great observation. Le let you answer, ask a whole lot of more questions. And actually guides you if you want to do some study. What am I going to look at? Some of those those commentaries and stuff that Marge gave, gave you last time. What I, what I want you to do, most of all, is to make your own observations first. Before you go running to a commentary. Before you read what it says in the column. I used to have a Harper Study Bible. And at the bottom it had all this stuff. It's like, oh, I know the answer because it's right here. <laughs> well, that, that's one guy's idea. But to really, for this to be your scripture, you need to open your heart and say, what is this saying to me? What is God saying to me? Before you go saying, what did C.S. Lewis say or anybody else? Interesting that he said that he gave 
is only begotten son. Normally when you give, you give to somebody. This one, he didn't say it. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believed, so it's not specific to this individual, whoever believed in him would have everlasting life. Those are big, I mean, it's like Bob said at the beginning, those are big observations, mm -hmm. right? He, he gave his only son. I go back to what does that mean that God loved us, loved the world. He so loved that he gave. But the, the interesting thing is he gave to, he doesn't know who he will give it to. Right. It's just he gave. He gave it. Normally you give something to somebody. Right. This one is... Great. Bob, you had a... Well, that raises the issue that if somebody does not know Jesus, I mean, if they, they live in the Amazon jungle and not been exposed to that, so what happens to them? Well, this passage isn't addressing that question. Okay. This passage is addressing... I don't hear it addressing that question. It says, whoever believes... So is, is there a belief? Now, to answer that question, you've got to go back and ask about the character of God and the purposes of God. Um, I mean, it was, I think it's Calvin who talks about, um, you know, people upset that somebody's not, not being saved. And Calvin said, wait a minute. That anybody is saved is incredible. Because all of us have sinned and fallen short of God. So anyone is, is huge. God doesn't have to do any of that. He does not define the recipient. Right, right. By saying he gave. He gave his son. Not put his son there that whosoever believes in him. And, and so believes in him. Is it believing in the son? Is it believing in God? You see, those are just... If you start having that dialogue and start playing with those pieces of the scripture and asking those questions, it, it's much richer than just a slogan we put on our refrigerator, right? It, it really starts to have life and it has implications for other passages that you're reading. You connect this love of God with another statement about the love of God and you go, oh wait, this is, we're talking about God. Other observations, you when, whenever you think about uh, he gave to whoever believes, mm -hmm. yeah. then you start to think about people that you don't think deserve it. Right. Now, I know they believe in Jesus, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. You I'm not sure. Yeah. No, I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, when I, when I started in ministry, I, there were some people who I was sure did not belong in the church. <laughs> and I like to say, I had, and with my cosmic weeder, I was ready to... <laughs> you know? God said, no. I'm doing something remarkable in that person. And you don't know about it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> it's not about me, is it? Not about my taste. Yeah. Other observations? I want to go back to the world, uh -huh. because you think of, at the time that this was written, right. what the world looked like to that particular group of people, uh -huh. and it's a much bigger place today than it was then. Right. I, I just yeah. don't think they looked at their world as very large, yet here, you know, it's being, it's all inclusive. That would be a good trail to, to think on. Could keep going on. translation then huh? too? What trans translation? Translation of the world, the word. Yeah, world. that's where I'd go next. I'd say, so what does that world mean? Mm -hmm. What did that mean in in Greek? What did it mean in Hebrew? Mm -hmm. Does that relate? I think of other worlds. So how does that relate to creation? It is is for the Hebrew mind, for Nicodemus mind, that's that's the world God created. All those mm -hmm. things. So is it is it just the world that I understand? I mean, to me, that's the the mind-blowing thing is bigger than the world, I understand, okay. as I look mm -hmm. at it. But, mm -hmm. see, I think that's a really healthy question, and then that sets you up to ask questions beyond that. What does that mean? What is that like? Um, who's, who's thinking about that? And that, that's, that's really healthy. 
That, that makes the scripture not so scary. Because you can ask questions of it. And that's okay. There is somebody, another hand. Ted, did you have something? No, I had a thought based on what she said. Okay. And that was it took me back to Genesis. Yeah. And where you went with creation. Yeah. Okay. God created the world. Yeah. Okay. And he created much more than that. Right. Because he created light and darkness. Right. And so it isn't just the rock and the water. He created everything beyond that, too. Everything beyond it, right. Yeah. That's it. I, my mind's getting big. I'm going to explode here in a minute. I right. have trouble, Jeff, with the word love. Mm -hmm. I could not think of another word or to express love. Yeah, so so what I would do is I would write in the column, define love. Find synonyms for love. And then I, then I would start looking, I mean, because I have some language, I know that there are three Greek words for love. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, what, what word is this? Um, what, what is, and what are the implications of that word? And that takes me farther. Um, but I, I, I think when you hit a word and you go, oh, man, I can't think of anything else about that. Yeah, so now I need to go to somebody else. <laughs> I need to go beyond. See, this is just giving you the groundwork and the thinking to go pick up a commentary. And you read the commentary and say, well, he saw that. <laughs> oh, she's got a good point here, you know? And, and for me, the best commentaries have three or four com ideas in them so that they can say, well, this group thinks this, and this group thinks that, and I think this. So I don't have to think what the commentary says. I'm like, I like what that first group said. I, that's it. So it, it just helps you dig, and it, and it gives you permission to, to ask even some rudimentary questions. What is love? What is that love? And, and from, you know where I, um, love moves God to give. Love is God's motivation to give. So why is God doing this? Because God loves me. I don't know if I want to go right into application, but I, I, I look for those connections. Um, I said, um, yeah, I wanted to define God's love. So is big, expansive. Um, there's no pre-qualifications to that love. He is, it's, it's past tense. God's so loved. He's already loved us. That's a reality. That's a fact. That's right in front of us. Um, all people, uh, all races, all tribes, all ages, past and present and future, love motivates giving away. It's, and it's not alone. He's not going to take it back. It's a gift. Um, God has a son. So I'm learning something about God here. God has only one son. And so when I think about that, I think about my own son. You know, giving away your son. What kind of love for me does that? So I just keeps expanding it. So, um, who believes in Him? Is that Son or God? Uh, anyone who believes. No limitation. Belief brings us to life over death. Should not perish. But have life everlasting. Um, I, I, I just... So I, I go through a whole passage that I'm going to preach on. And I, I take it apart and I observe as much as I can. And then... I can start looking at a commentary, or then I can say, "What is? What do they say of the footnote?" Or, you know, you can, then you can start working on those pieces. But if, it, if it's just for you, you need to listen to what you're observing, because sometimes that's how God speaks to us in the scriptures. You said something that I think those of us who are lay people need to hear: that we don't have to take the commentary as the Word of God. Right. It's just a, a theologian's mm -hmm. understanding. Trying to do his or And we're best. all theologians. Right. I mean, any time you start talking about God, you are a theologos. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's a good thing. Because it's good to talk about God. 
Okay, we're about to quit. I'm going to give you some homework. Um, two things I want you to do. I'd like you to go on and take verses 17 and 18 and make observations of those two verses. So John 3, 16, 17, and 18. Just see what, what comes out from that. And the second thing, I forgot to mention earlier, but if you open your Bible, at some point you're going to come to a page in the very beginning that says something like preface. I want you to read the preface. We never, I never read the preface. Yeah. Yeah. If somebody's writing a book, it's like, here's the preface. So, uh, I want to get the book. But the preface is very interesting when you start thinking about all these things, about how we got, they're going to tell you, how did we get, come to the conclusions of the NIV? Why do we use words like God Almighty or El Shaddai or God of the Angel Armies? So it helps you to understand what's going on. You know, it's only, in this case, only like three pages. But read it and, and then bring back what you discovered. And maybe if you have two versions at home, look at the other one. And see what they did and how they came about. And I, it's just trying to make it accessible. Okay? Yep. So let me pray. Gracious God, thank you for a word. Thank you for wanting us to know you, to understand you, to come closer to you. Thank you for giving men and women inspiration to communicate with us. Thank you for those witnesses who told their story, and those who told the story that told the story that told the story, those who meticulously wrote it down, those who dared to face death so that we could have your word. Come Holy Spirit on each one of us. Grow in our hearts the love for your word. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.